Is 799 available? A call for an air ambulance. A premature baby needs emergency care. Let's continue that for now. It's a completely different environment for patient care. Before we leave, we always take the baby to see the parents. We're a link in the chain of survival. Bandage One, next. An air ambulance races across the sky over Toronto. It is called Bandage One, and it carries a precious cargo. Darren McCoy, a premature baby only a few hours old, who needs the specialized care of the hospital for sick children. Aboard Bandage One, a portable incubator, a wide range of medical equipment, two air medics, and two specially trained neonatal transport nurses. Sheila Evans is a senior transport nurse. I started working in a nursery, a level two nursery, and I really enjoyed that. And I decided I liked um, the challenge of babies who were you know, really quite ill and being able to help them. If I knew about the transport team, I'd work quite closely with the transport team when I worked at a community hospital. I saw the team in action and I just was amazed. You go out on the transport as an assistant the first time and you suddenly, you're in a strange environment uh, with babies that are very sick and you're lacking the resources that you had at your own home hospital. You're humbled very easily. If I was brought up around planes, my father was a little private flying instructor. So it wasn't new to me to be on a plane. It was new to me to be on a helicopter. There's a bit of scariness involved in it because you're a medevac and you do go in conditions that are maybe a little bit more uh, tenuous than you would normally go in and you're in a small aircraft. It can be a little bit fatiguing and sometimes your ascent and descent can be a little rapid and so you have a bit of fatigue or sometimes a little bit of nausea and whatnot. But um, generally um, it's exciting initially, but then it just sort of becomes part of the job, and what's more is actually the patient. Um, patient's born this morning, okay. and he looks appropriate. He's on a rate of 28, and he's on... Uh... The call came from Oshawa General, which is about 30 miles from here. It was a mother who, this was her fourth pregnancy, and this uh, lady uh, woke up with severe pain. Um, in her abdomen at about 4 o'clock this morning and she was just 29 and a bit weeks pregnant. So very quickly they arranged for her to have a emergency cesarean section. But being born at 29 weeks gestation, which is quite early, the baby needed some help with some breathing. Then we gave the baby surfactant and that's what their lung illness is all about is RDS or respiratory distress syndrome and they have a shortage of surfactant in their lungs and the baby responded really wonderfully to the drug. Bandage One is a custom-designed Sikorsky S-76, one of a fleet of six helicopters that serves Ontario's nine million people. Rob Terrio has been an air medic for eight years. It's a completely different environment for patient care than uh, uh, the hospital environment, obviously, which is a fairly uh, calm environment from our perspective for a couple of reasons. One, because we're in a very cramped environment. Uh, two, it's noisy. It can be turbulent. Uh, the lighting isn't always ideal. And we're also dealing with the effects of altitude on, uh, on the patients. It can be a real challenge. The Sikorsky is based at Toronto's Island Airport. It serves an enormous area from Ottawa and Sudbury in the north to Windsor in the south. We're a link in the chain of survival. It's a great experience interacting with other services, with hospital staff, with ambulance staff, fire departments, police. We play a role in that link, which is quite unique. 
We do 1,000 to 1,300 calls a year. The two, three hour call is like six to eight hours of intensive labor. Uh, it's exhausting. There just happened to be an opening with the air ambulance. So I was contracted for six months to uh, work at the Toronto base. I'd asked the manager what kind of aircraft we were in, and he said, a BK-117. I knew nothing about aircraft. I didn't know whether it was a helicopter or a plane. My first day on the job, I found out it was a helicopter. I had no idea there were paramedics on board. Uh, and uh, I started my shift. Uh, I was given a used flight suit, and a half hour later, I was off on my first call. So I was, I was really <laughs> thrown into it. Bandage One is on call 24 hours a day. Between emergencies, the aircraft restocks depleted medical supplies and tops up its fuel tanks. While the aircraft is being serviced, a summons to pick up a patient seriously injured in an industrial accident in Kitchener. Pilot Kevin Cocatayo checks weather and files his flight plan. We never know from day to day what we're going to do. The weather dictates what we're actually going to do as far as uh, response is what we're enabled to take. It's thrilling in that aspect that we don't really get to plan too much ahead for what we're going to do. The only thing we really get to do is figure out a distance and how much fuel we're going to need. The rest we find out usually when we get overhead. We will check the weather not knowing what the priority of the call is or what the injury or sickness is so there is never any extra pressure on us to go because it's a two-year-old or an infant. You can't turn down an emergency call. Typically calls will come in at uh, 6, 6.30, and uh, you get an accident, for example, up in the Huntsville area. Um, our response time up there is 45, 50 minutes just to get to the patient. Um, sometimes we could be in hospital an hour and then another 45, 50 minutes back to a trauma center, and uh, then another hour, 45 minutes to an hour to clean up. You kind of live off your adrenaline almost and you still have this incredible uh, feeling of alertness and, uh, and you're always seeing something new and that just makes it really exciting. A sophisticated communication system links the emergency ward doctor in Kitchener, a doctor at the trauma center in Toronto, and Bandage One air medic, Patrick Auger. Hey, I uh, met this, this fellow about an hour ago. Came in last night having had some sort of an industrial accident where a belt or something from a machine or some piece of machinery flew into his face. As I understand it, he's got multiple fractures of his mandible, his maxilla, his pterygoid plates, the patient's jaw and skull are fractured. The attending doctor wants to install an airway so air can reach the man's lungs through the damaged bone and tissue. And I think if we can't get that, the only other option would be to arrange a trach under local. Uh, Rob, you copy that? Uh, it's Pat, and I copy that. It all started way back when I was about 16 years of age. I was going out with some of my friends. We were in a snack bar, and a uh, person uh, two or three tables down started to choke. I remember the entire room going silent. No one was able to help this person. And we basically watched this person uh, drop to the ground and go unconscious uh, until the ambulance arrived. I would say that that was the one event that had the most impact. It was an event that I felt powerless. You know, what am I supposed to do? I had no idea what to do. Just uh, in the event that we get a, diverted to a cardiac call or something with a line crew between uh, the way things have been going the last couple of days, anything can happen between uh, where we land and arriving at the hospital. Medics Pat and Rob work grueling shifts, 12 hours a day for four straight days. The end of a shift could find them miles from home base, so they often wind up with 16-hour days. Kitchener, 799. 799, go ahead. Do you have an ETA for an ambulance? Um, his chart is sitting on the desk. The air medic's job is to keep patient Steve Kurt alive during the transfer from Kitchener to Sunnybrook Hospital, a designated adult trauma center 
with specialists and equipment not available in smaller hospitals. Now, having been on the job for a while, you see a great deal of uh, human tragedy. And uh, a lot of what we see, a lot of the injuries and illnesses, you, you get used to. You become so focused on assessing and treating patients that you often, um, you know, you maintain a certain degree of compassion for that patient and, and you express that uh, to help calm them and uh, prepare them for the transport. You often don't think of that person as someone with a life outside those immediate circumstances. If we land on the road and, and we're caring for someone who's been struck mo by a motor vehicle as they're uh, crossing the road, um, you're focused, uh, you, you go through a set of priorities in assessing and treating that patient, and then you're, you're ready to load that patient into the helicopter. We notice the patient's grocery bags on the ground. Suddenly now you realize this is someone with a family that they were on their way home to. Uh, they could be married, they may have children. Is it easier if we assist your brain and provide screens that? Does it does it hurt? Because we're uh, cautious by nature, we'll just uh, immobilize you for the trip, and and then Sunnybrook can reassess you uh, once we get there. Okay. And uh, if you need anything, just. Like raise a finger or something if you need something for pain or something to... Are you having any pain right now? No? Okay. Two, three. Steve has been intubated to enable air to reach his lungs. He is put into a restraint because any movement of the tubes could be life-threatening. We're just going to uh, see your family on our way. True professionals, Rob and Pat, take a moment to reassure the accident victim's family. Give them call, the hospital call in about an hour and a half. Okay. And they should have them settled in by now. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. You know the number there for the emergency? Yes, we have it. We do okay. have the number. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Steve. Good luck. Bye. Like Pat, Rob Terrio found motivation for a career as an air medic in a traumatic accident. As a young musician, he was on a cross-country tour with a band. We were involved in a serious motor vehicle collision, and we lost control on, uh, on an icy hill and uh, went off the road. The motorhome flipped over, and uh, one of the uh, band members was trapped in the berth above the driver's seat. When I spent two and a half hours alone with him in the snow, just talking to him, trying to keep him calm. When the ambulance and fire department came, I was so impressed with how they worked on getting him out. I kept thinking about uh, the ambulance crew, and I returned to Toronto and took a number of college courses, a year of sciences, and got into the ambulance program, and I've been doing this now for 12 years, the last eight of which I've been working on the helicopter. Suction that out, right? Okay. It's going to go down the tube. Okay. Stephen, we're suctioning your airway around it, but it doesn't seem to be Is that okay. A better? Yeah. Okay, good. okay, good stuff. All right. Okay, we're going to take you out of the ambulance now, and uh, we're at Sunnybrook. Thank you. 
intubated. Wait. It's here and early. Good. How are you feeling? Good. You're here at Sunnybrook now. With Steve delivered to the trauma center, Bandage One heads out on another call. Winged aircraft were among the earliest conceptions of manned flight. Leonardo da Vinci drew sketches for one, and many were inspired to put his theory into practice. But the problem seemed insurmountable. Igor Sikorsky made his first attempt to build a helicopter in 1909. He had many failures, but persevered until 20 years later, he succeeded with the VS 300. Igor Sikorsky's son, Sergei, has vivid memories of his father at work. He first taught himself how to fly the helicopter with the machine in a hover or moving very, very slowly and only a few inches or a few feet from the point of takeoff. And only after he had become a qualified helicopter pilot, then did he begin to, as one says, to expand the envelope of the helicopter to, be able to start flying faster and higher and further. It was built uh, on literally a shoestring. Automotive parts, including the differential from a Ford pickup truck, were used as part of the transmission. Everything was done by various sized pulleys and V-belts. Just after the VS-300 had begun to demonstrate its full final configuration, that is, a completely dependable, completely satisfactory flight control with the one single rotor, the United States Army Air Corps awarded Sikorsky a contract for a larger two-seat version of it. This first model here is a, a rather crude depiction of the R-4. This is the first helicopter that Sikorsky aircraft really put into production and was used in a number of the earliest rescue missions. The first humanitarian mission was in 1944 uh, when destroyer Turner blew up near the mouth of the New York Harbor Badly injured, badly burned sailors were being brought ashore on small lifeboats, and the Coast Guard flew blood plasma to these wounded survivors on the beach. Very shortly after that, in Burma, a young Army Air Corps pilot named Lieutenant Carter Harmon made four trips deep into Japanese territory to ferry out uh, the four crew members of an airplane that had crashed in the jungles of Burma. But the helicopter wasn't ready for World War II. Fixed-wing aircraft remained paramount. They were used extensively to fly casualties to base hospitals behind the lines and to carry medical supplies close to the front. The experience gained during the war in medical evacuation by air was quickly adapted to civilian use. The need in areas like rural Saskatchewan was obvious. In the winter months, drifting snow obliterated the rough country roads. Whole communities were isolated, and no doctor could reach the sick or injured. Two visionary war veteran pilots, Keith Malcolm and Don Watson, sold the idea of Canada's first civilian air ambulance service to the government of Saskatchewan. For their first aircraft, they selected a Norseman. Canada's first true bush plane. Well, he said, how do we get that? So I said, well, we have to go to War Assets Disposal Corporation in Ottawa and uh, see the lady that runs it, who's incidentally, was, the name is Mary Bidgood, and, uh, and, and uh, see what kind of a deal we can make to get that airplane away from War Assets. Well, we did it, and we got the airplane. I had flown Norseman before, but he hadn't, and I had never flown on the prairies and in the hills and in some pretty short fields. He needed to learn about skis. February the 3rd, we had the first call to Liberty, Saskatchewan. And uh, it, was a, it was a very important event in Saskatchewan. They were connected for the first time with medicine in the wintertime. Call had to come through the doctor, and there was a lady that was very ill. 
first of all, we had to identify the farm location by so many miles east from here and so many miles south and odd shapes of the buildings or whatever. And then we asked them to light a smoke fire when they heard the airplane. That would give us wind and location. So we went and we found the place okay. It wasn't a very nice day, but it, we found it. And uh, they came out with a team of horses on a sleigh, took the stretcher to the house, and, and the nurse went with them and picked up the uh, patient, brought her back to the airplane, went back to Regina without a vent, into the ambulance, down to the Grey Nuns Hospital. A couple of weeks later, she was better. So t times were tough. And I could see then that until they got roads and until they got electric power and a better hospitalization program, there was nothing more important in Saskatchewan to those people than that air ambulance service. Malcolm and Watson's idea of an air ambulance service was successful, and similar services popped up everywhere. But there were limitations. Fixed-wing aircraft need a safe spot and elbow room for takeoffs and landings. To many, the helicopter remained unproven. Then, 1945, a barge ran aground off Connecticut. A nearby helicopter saved the lives of the entire crew. The incident would have world consequences. The US military first became convinced of the utility of the helicopter in the opening weeks of the Korean War. Uh, there was a handful of helicopters assigned to the Army Air Corps. They began almost immediately the evacuation of critically wounded soldiers back to the hospitals. The results were just so dramatic that the call went out for more helicopters. Military doctors have known for decades that the faster a soldier can be properly treated for wounds, the greater the chance of a recovery. In the Korean War, the first attempts to carry battlefield casualties by helicopter to base hospitals. 15% of the wounded rode out on helicopters. The war in Vietnam and the helicopter dramatically improved with powerful turbine engines came into its own. 90% of American casualties were carried from the battlefield by helicopter. This wartime development led swiftly to the widespread use of helicopters as civilian air ambulances. It was in the late 60s, early 70s, that uh, people began to design the interiors of helicopters uh, for stabilization and for first aid, and also to provide urgent medical support care as you moved the patient from one hospital to another hospital. The S-76 was one of the very first helicopters that was designed by Sikorsky Aircraft, not as a military machine converted to a civil, but actually from the start as a civil aircraft. A number of the uh, medical institutions began to look with greater interest at the S-76 because of its very, very high speed and because of the fact that it now had a cabin big enough, roomy enough, to where you could put permanent installations of medical equipment that uh, were unthinkable with a smaller helicopter, say, two decades ago. After 20 years, Ontario's air ambulance service transports as many as 16,000 patients a year, 40 a day. Though the service retains fixed-wing aircraft for the northern reaches of the province, increasingly, helicopters like Bandage One have taken over. I can say that my father would be very, very proud of the use of the helicopter. Very proud of the fact that it has grown to be a unique, in his words, a unique instrument for the saving of human lives.
Bandage One is a Sikorsky S76 Alpha, turbo-engined and streamlined with retractable landing gear. It flies level, not nose down like most helicopters, an important consideration for patient comfort. And it can be flown on instruments. The S-76 is manufactured in Stratford, Connecticut. It was designed initially for servicing offshore oil drilling rigs. It has a long range and a top speed of almost 290 kilometers an hour. It has twin engines for safety. In Peterborough, Ontario, the aircraft are modified for air ambulance service by AirTech Canada. AirTech President James Mewitt. Air ambulances are one of our main specialties. Most of them have been fixed wing airplanes. We started with them and uh, we're really pleased to have the opportunity to work on the S-76 because it was a design that, uh, or it was an aircraft that the operator had some experience with in the air ambulance role. We got the opportunity to benefit from that experience and refine the design to what it is today. It's a high-speed helicopter, which is definitely appreciated by the medics. Uh, the floor is low and easy to get into. The, uh, the sliding door feature is another thing, which is nice. The, it, the door doesn't get in the way of loading the helicopter. We had found this particular chair, which had the features we wanted. Could be moved sideways, fore and aft, swiveled, and it had a reclining mechanism, armrests, headrests, and, and uh, it was quite a nice design. We designed it with um, bonded honeycomb panels, which are light and strong and nice to work with. The aircraft is, is fairly tight inside when it comes to loading the, the stretchers. So a big concern was whether you could actually get a stretcher inside. Most of the modeling we did for that was on a computer. We satisfied ourselves that we came up with a design that would allow actually loading the aircraft as well as restraining the patients. Cabinets are specially designed to house medical supplies and bandage one sophisticated radio links. Conversions can cost half a million dollars. AirTech also installs avionics, updating the electronic navigation and control systems aboard the helicopter. We're pretty well self-contained. Uh, some people have referred to us as being a mobile intensive care unit. Uh, a mobile emergency department. We're pretty well set up that way. On the stretcher here is uh, most of the our essential equipment that we would carry on a call. Here we've got uh, a ProPAC monitor. And this just monitors electrocardiogram, blood pressures, the saturation of oxygen in the blood. Our kit bag here is an accessory kit bag with uh, some life-saving equipment bag valve mask, which we, if someone uh, is having difficulty breathing, we can assist in their ventilation or provide full ventilatory support. We have an airway kit, which has a number of uh, artificial airways, ranging from newborn sizes right up to adults. Our last piece of equipment, or kit bag, is our drug kit. We can actually manage a whole range or spectrum of patients and maintain that care in flight. Uh, we carry a, a whole variety of equipment in the back of the aircraft, some of which is, is redundant to the equipment we carry on a stretcher, and that's so that we can go from one call to another without having to come back to base to restock. We have a main oxygen supply in the cabin of the aircraft. We have four uh, large oxygen cylinders here, and that's generally good for uh, two to three calls before we need to, to refill those tanks. And this is our oxygen regulator here, so we just regulate the flow from here. We can also connect our ventilator to the main supply. And uh, we have a, a suction unit over on the side here uh, for clearing the airway of blood and secretions. We carry uh, inside as well a cardiac uh, monitor defibrillator. This is for managing our cardiac patients. And the defibrillator paddles uh, are used for uh, resuscitating the patient who's a victim of cardiac arrest and who has what we call a, a shockable rhythm. In our tail section, we carry uh, some more equipment still. We carry a couple of extra portable oxygen tanks, a uh, portable suction unit, all of our mobilization devices for uh, people with suspected spinal cord injuries and uh, traction devices for fractured limbs, and uh, pneumatic anti-shock armament, for, uh, which are uh, like the, uh, the G-suits that jet fighter pilots wear. 
and our uh, survival gear uh, in the event that uh, we go down. Okay, so you go into the helicopter. It's going to get a little noisy. And just a 10 minute flight downtown, and your mummy's going to see you there. A sophisticated aircraft loaded with emergency equipment, a highly trained medical crew, and the calls for help never cease. Three year old Jamie Lee Jackson is suffering severe seizures and is in critical condition. She has been sedated and intubated, and bandage one will rush her to the hospital for sick children. That's the last time we'll be able to auscultate the chest because it gets noisy. So, uh, yeah, we're going to give you a set of headphones. The types of patients we're, we're transporting are uh, quite, quite critical, and we require uh, equipment that's small, portable, and can aid us in uh, our transfer of the patients. So we're always looking for stuff that's really tiny, like our ventilator here, which is uh, actually uh, quite a sophisticated little ventilator. I don't know how well you can see that, but, but uh, it's an incredibly, incredibly sophisticated little unit. And the nice thing about this ventilator, not only is it capable of delivering different modes of ventilation for us, uh, but it also conserves oxygen. We, uh, we have an oxygen tank under our stretcher that has a very limited amount of O2, and uh, this device will only consume oxygen when it's delivering a breath, as opposed to using uh, what we call a bag valve device. And this thing requires a constant flow of 12 to 15 liters. So using this, we consume a lot more oxygen. With this, we can serve it. So it's one of the other benefits of piece of equipment like that. Medcom 799. There's a lot of things that we have to monitor. Because of the, the change in barometric pressure, that has effects on our uh, intravenous solutions, and we've got to really monitor that in transit. Because we don't have the height in the helicopter to run IV solutions by gravity, uh, what we'll often do is put pressure infusers. These are uh, like inflatable bags that go around the IV bag to uh, drive the fluids in under pressure, even if we're running fluids at a really slow rate. In this case, what we, uh, what we do with uh, our pediatric patients quite often is we'll use uh, a syringe pump. And uh, what this does is it, is it, um, it drops some fluid from the bag and attach the tubing. This goes to the IV site. And this uh, device just drives the fluid in at a, at a fixed rate. Uh, because it's very difficult to deliver solutions and medications uh, at a fixed rate uh, by other methods because of the vibration of the aircraft and the, the movement. And so uh, the syringe pumps are very, uh, very precise. And uh, you want to restrict the fluids for someone this size. The world said we're just coming up down 10-7 now. Yeah. Oh, they make that, uh, yeah, 1047 downtime there, bud. The objective with someone like this is to keep the out of hospital time to an absolute minimum. Because when things tend to go wrong with patients, it tends to be during the transport phase. So it was a fairly short distance flight. It was only a seven minute flight, but had they gone by land, it would have taken a good 45 minutes. And with that, a child who's that critical, anything can go wrong during the transport phase. Rob and Pat get their stretcher back aboard the helicopter and quickly reorganize their equipment. Bandage One responds to yet another emergency call. In Cambridge, west of Toronto, an emphysema victim. Condition deteriorating rapidly. Rob. Go ahead. Uh, 
Our flight time is about 20 minutes from Cambridge to Toronto. Out of hospital time will be about uh, maybe 40 minutes. Okay. I will um, pass you back and let me know about the staff so we can make a decision on how we're going to get them out. Transport nurse Davina Douglas also wants the helicopter. Oh, hi, Pat. This is Davina calling from Sick Kids Transport Team. Um, is 799 available? I really enjoy flying. It shortens your traveling time if you do get to fly in the helicopter versus having to go two or three hours by road. Okay, um, we'll go by road and we'll try and see if we can fly back with them. Great, thank you very much. Bye. Another premature baby at a hospital 60 miles north needs transport to the hospital for sick children. Dr. Barry Smith is chief of neonatology. We send the neonatal intensive care unit to the baby uh, rather than the reverse, so that the transport team, in a sense, is a portable neonatal intensive care unit with the equipment, but more importantly, the skills to get to the baby quickly and to stabilize the baby. And our philosophy is that the team spends as long as is necessary to get that baby stable uh, prior to bringing the baby back to sick kids. To Sheila Evans, the patient and the family are paramount. While neonatal nursing is really being a patient advocate, when you go into a transport role, um, you're doing that, but it's one step further. You're going into a strange environment, so for yourself, you have to adapt. For the family, you have to build a relationship of trust. If you could put yourself in a parent's shoes, you're walking in, they meet you, and someone comes and tells you that your baby's very sick and talks to you about what's going on with their baby and is going to take their baby to a strange hospital and maybe even a strange town. It's very hard. Rob and Pat arrive in Cambridge. Their first task is to help stabilize the patient, Chris Wilson, for the flight. They find he has only one lung, and that lung has collapsed. My name's, my name's Patrick. I'm a flight paramedic control. I'm just going to be looking over our equipment, OK? And uh, we're going to get you set up, and we're going to be flying you to Toronto. The flying aspect of it certainly adds a twist. We're concerned about the change in barometric pressure and the effects of altitude. Certainly, uh, patients with chest trauma who've had a collapsed lung are uh, major concerns. Pat is the youngest of the air medics. He has been flying for less than two years and finds the job a constant challenge. I'm going to move this bed down. I come in every day, every shift, and I learn something new. For me, being new and just newly certified and being matched up with a senior flight paramedic, um, it's, I'm still in this high, high level learning phase still, even though I'm certified. A lot of cases, we're going to pick up patients that are being managed by four, five, six healthcare professionals at uh, sending facilities. And we're putting them into an environment in a cramped space, um, and the patient's being managed by two people. Sheila and Davina arrive at a hospital in Barrie to collect the premature baby. This baby was a 31-week female infant who was born a little bit too early due to uh, separation of the placenta from the uterus. They had to do an emergency C-section to remove the baby. Um, she's actually did quite well. Very well. She's not too much with the breathing. When we arrive, if everything is you know under control and well, we will get report and an update on the patient, and then we go through and do a physical assessment of the patient and um, try and start moving our equipment onto the baby so that we can make sure that the baby's tolerating these changes. And we just do some fine tuning of, uh, you know, our equipment so that the baby's, you know, very stable blood pressure, heart rate, and adjusting to our breathing machine. can take anywhere from one and a half hours to the longest I've been out is maybe nine hours on a run to stabilize. But there's no sense in leaving a hospital um, unless the child is stable. 
So we need to let her just rest for about half an hour and let that uh, surfactant absorb, and then we'll do another blood test. And based on that, we'll be able to go. We will speak to the parents and tell them about you know, what's their understanding of what's going on? And usually it's very hard for them to describe because they're been so overwhelmed. So we go over and we try to build on that relationship of trust. They're more than welcome to take, um, ask any sort of questions that they might have about their baby. And then when we're really comfortable that they feel okay with what's going on with their baby and what the plan initially of care is, um, we'll go into some information about where their baby's going to be and, and who will be looking after their baby so that they're okay with where their baby's going. Baby Conway, stabilized now, will have to wait. Pat and Rob's patient needs immediate transport to a trauma center. We've got notes, we've got x-rays, we've got uh, all our equipment. We'll be uh, going downstairs and across the road over to Toronto General. Any patient who is unstable uh, to the point where uh, we're doing everything we can to keep them alive until they receive definitive care, and often that means surgery. Um, those patients are a challenge to, to care for. Any patient who uh, suddenly deteriorates during the flight is a big challenge to care for. Can you give a like, bigger squeeze, a higher volume, like bigger volume? Let's sit them up a little bit too, Pat. You're going to have to stand. Okay. Oh. Is that better? Okay, we're going to try and give a ventil and an aftervent treatment. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, now we need to disconnect here. Okay, ready? What he needed was an endotracheal tube to assist his ventilations. We knew he needed that, and we were quite capable and quite willing to, to do that. But if we intubated him, it would remove him as a candidate for lung transplant. It's a difficult decision to deal with and also difficult to manage him the way we were managing him. Uh, that kind of a call is, is challenging because of how critical he is and also because of the, the, the cramped space in the, the back of the aircraft. Number four. Right. Okay. What was the order for? Just continue that for now. Get rid of this. Okay. okay, he got four. French. Uh, what's your ETA till touchdown? We'll be landing in about um, 14 minutes and rolling through your doors, um, I would say 25 minutes from now. Okay, give me an assessment of whether you think uh, you would prefer to intubate him in the air or wait till you get here. Uh, we're comfortable just assisting him with a bag belt device at this point. Okay. All right, if, if this condition begins to deteriorate, then I guess you will intubate him on earth. Yeah, we'll do that if we need to. Thanks. Okay, what's he trying to say? I'm not sure. Deep valve? Nearing the hospital, not wanting to destroy patient Chris Wilson's chance of having a lung transplant, Pat and Rob decide they will not intubate. Okay, Chris, uh, just to let you know, we're almost there. And uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, we're going to land on the roof of the Children's Hospital. And uh, we'll get you inside where it's a little less of a chaotic environment. I know this mask is horribly uncomfortable. Sorry about that. The air medics have done their job. They have delivered the patient. 
Now it's up to the doctors in the trauma unit. For Pat and Rob, the sense of accomplishment is hard to express. It's always satisfying to have saved someone's life or to have made a difference. And it's forever balanced with a tragedy. Most of our calls have positive outcomes. And uh, the sense of reward you get from that is just almost indescribable. And it's, it's rarely in the form of a pat on the back or a thank you. Those, those things just rarely happen. It, it's just in you know, knowing yourself that you've done the best you could and that you've made a difference. For Rob and Pat and the flight crew, the day is over. Regulations require pilots to have 12 hours rest between shifts. With a new crew aboard, Bandage One heads north for Sheila and Davina, waiting with their premature baby. Before we leave, we always take uh, the baby to see the parents. And for some moms, this is their first opportunity to see the baby. It's very important for them to start developing this bonding process. Even though they're often quite scared to touch their baby, they're afraid that they might hurt their baby. That one there, that's the breath that's going in. But you can see her breathing is nice and comfortable. She's able to take her own breath as well. We make sure they touch their baby uh, because this is the, probably their first opportunity and try and if they can get up and give them a little kiss, um, and talk to them, they can hear their voice and let them know that they're going to be okay. And it, amazingly, quite often if we've got a baby that's very ill, you'll see the baby improve. Sometimes it's just a little bit, but you know, it's like they know who's there. establish and encourage the father because sometimes they're from a long distance away and the father's got to come and give a report and back to the mother as to how their baby's doing and it seems a lot more meaningful and credible when dad's telling mom how baby's doing. Constantly, your whole trip, you're monitoring things and checking the safety of the patient. You want to make sure the isolate's all strapped down. We make sure at all times we're seat belted. We have to discuss with the pilots different altitudes to fly at. Um, some babies can't tolerate a high altitude, so we'll have them pressurized to sea level. It's knowing that you're doing something that's helping these little patients and it's very rewarding when you see them come back um, when they're two or three. I mean, it just, and you can't relate to what these poor parents are going through. Everything happens so fast. At the hospital for sick children, Sheila and Davina find their mission isn't quite over. They're told to take baby Conway, now stable, to nearby Women's College Hospital an alternate neonatal intensive care unit. Sometimes you go home at night and you just can't go to sleep right away because that baby is um, in your mind for a good many hours and you're playing it over again and you're concerned about the parents and you're just, you're hoping that when you come on the next day that, you know, that um, the baby's still there if the baby hasn't passed on. I love my job. Yeah, I really love it. I find that I can help a lot of people. It's um, stimulating. It's uh, you go above and beyond nursing. Um, you help a lot of families, and, and you, most importantly, you help a lot of infants to make it through to a normal toddlerhood and childhood. Here you are at Women's College Hospital. Mm -hmm. And happy to be here. Nice. You too. <laughs> Bandage One, her pilots, medics, and nurses, airborne angels on flights of mercy.